Good evening. I'm Jane McAuliffe, the Director of National and International Outreach here at the Library of Congress, and I'd really like to welcome you to tonight's event, which concludes the first term of our 22nd Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry, Tracy K. Smith. As I'm sure you know, the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, has appointed Tracy Smith to a second term as Poet Laureate. And she was eager to do so because Tracy has already accomplished a great deal. Um, and then I feel like there's this tendency to divide our sense of what America is into two regions. I mean, it's silly because it's such a big place, but we have you know, the urban, coastal region, and then the, the rural center. Right. Um, and so I thought, well, I spend a lot of time in these r urban, <laughs> coastal places, or places where people who will soon graduate from a college will probably go to. Right. Um, so why not, why not see what happens if I can cross that line somehow? And when you went to these towns, uh, who came? Were they you know, beret-wearing hipsters, or <laughs> were they people that surprised you? Uh, well, some of the towns are so small that it was people who were aware that an event was happening, yeah. <laughs> and that's something that doesn't usually happen. Nice. Um, so a, a pretty healthy cross-section. Um, when we were in South Carolina, um, the locations that um, Representative Clyburn had kind of curated for us, because he, he was excited to sort of take ownership of his district, um, were connected historically. They had a strong um, sense of participation in the civil rights movement. And um, I think that meant that, that many of the people who came were members of a black church that we visited and they came. Um, there were alumni and community members of a school, Old Somerton High School, which is one of the schools that was desegregated during the group of suits around the Brown v. Board of Education. So there were members of that graduating class who came. Uh, many people in those communities came out because they said, oh, there's a black woman doing something on this national scale. I want my kids who are black to see this. Wonderful. Um, similar thing happened, but in the opposite terms, when I was in um, another community. It's, it'll come to me sometime tonight. <laughs> That's the problem of doing things so quickly, um, where it was a, a white family who said, we live in a town that's really racially divided, and I want my kids to be able to cross that line, so I want them to come here and hear so what you have to say. just coming was a, a crossing mm -hmm. of barriers. Did you get responses that surprised you, that you hadn't expected at all? Well, um, I don't know what I was expecting. Yeah. I, I was like a little bit just uh, curious. Right. So anything felt um, useful. There were people who wrote poetry, um, who, right. and uh, some places who said, I'll read a poem, you know, so we have some great recordings, not nice. here tonight, but of, right. of people saying, here's a chance, I'm yes. going to read a poem. There's someone at Cannon Air Force Base who said, I write poems in this secret journal that I don't want anybody to see, but I'll read you a couple now. Wow. Um, <laughs> you read uh, a variety of poems, not just your own, other people's. What kinds of poems went over well? Uh, well, the two that I shared tonight are two that I've read before, and um, I felt like going over well means people, you know, listen and have theories about the poem, or even just want to talk about what, what the poems remind them of. Right. So those, and there are two others that I perhaps will hear tonight. Yes, we will. Um, that um, are, be, behave in different ways. You know, one that goes back to childhood and narrates a somewhat familiar experience, and then aligns it, I think, with a, a larger sense. Um, and another that's a family story, mm -hmm. thinking about um, addiction within a family. Um, yeah, people are, I, if, if they know I'm not going to test them, yes. if they know that I, and this is something I kind of go out of my way to say is I'm just curious. This is what I say to my students. Yes. What do you notice? Anything that you notice is useful and valuable to talk about. Maybe it will activate somebody else's feeling of something else that, that they noticed. So just let's hear it. Um, maybe it's because it's a community where people know each other, but there hasn't been a sense of timidity. People, uh, so in some ways, most of the poems have gone over because people have kind of wanted to talk about them. That's wonderful. Now you have a new collection coming out. Wade in the Water, next Tuesday? It's out, it's been out for a couple Tuesdays. Tuesdays, okay. Yeah. Uh, it's a beautiful collection. 
Uh, I wonder if you'd read the uh, title poem for sure. us. Sure. Page 15. Thanks. <laughs> um, so this poem narrates a, an encounter. I, I hope it's somewhat clear, but I'll tell you I, I attended a ring shout. Um, and that's where the scene that occupies most of the poem took place. Wade in the water for the Geechee Gullah ring shouters. One of the women greeted me. I love you, she said. She didn't know me, but I believed her. And a terrible new ache rolled over in my chest, like in a room where the drapes have been swept back. I love you. I love you, as she continued down the hall, past other strangers, each feeling pierced suddenly by pillars of heavy light. I love you throughout the performance, in every hand clap, every stomp. I love you in the rusted iron chains someone was made to drag until love let them be unclasped and left empty in the center of the ring. I love you in the water where they pretended to wade, singing that old blood deep song that dragged us to those banks and cast us in. I love you, the angles of it scraping at each throat, shouldering past the swirling dust motes in those beams of light that whatever we now knew we could let ourselves feel knew to climb. Oh, woods, oh, dogs, oh, tree, oh, gun, oh, girl, run, oh, miraculous, many, gone, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, is this love the trouble you promised? What does it mean in this poem to say I love you to a stranger, which seems so much at the heart of what you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the question that, that set that poem into motion because someone did greet me and say that and it, it felt like such a gift and it hurt at the same time and it allowed so much to come out, so many conflicting feelings. Um, and, and not because you doubted her sincerity. No, I didn't actually. She, it, I could have because she said it to every single person that she met, but there was no doubting it. No. It was like a really genuine, beautiful thing. Yes. You know, vulner, vulnerable, making for both people gesture. Um, and so I wanted to just go back to that and try and figure out what, what, where that came from and what it had given me. Um, I don't know what it means, but I have a feeling that we kind of need to learn what it means. Yes. Yes, in these times. Yeah. What does it mean to be Poet Laureate in these contentious times when everything from what's decent to what's science is a matter of such hot debate? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I feel like it, it's added urgency to my belief that we are better when we're more attentive, when we can sort of say, I'm not going to accept this like word package without parsing it and testing its like validity in whatever terms that are valid you know like emotional or or otherwise um and i've got to move i'll be better equipped to just be yes. in this world if i'm willing to move away from what i'm certain of right. and say there's there's got to be something i can stand to learn um there's got to be something i don't recognize about myself that could somehow, if I can face it, help. Your example is quite different than the role that many writers are playing in this era, which is to be very polemical, mm -hmm. very political. Uh, you're being political in a very different way that I think is, is really provocative. Uh, last year you said in, in an interview, poetry helps me contend with the smallness of spirit, the greed, the dishonesty, the disregard for the lives of others at the root of American politics. Now, fortunately, we've moved beyond all that. <laughs> In your introduction to American Journal, which is an anthology you'll be bringing out this fall, 
Uh, you say that you hope these poems might make us a little less alien to each other. That's such a great goal. How can a poem do that? Well, you know, it does it in a lot of small ways that I hope add up to something. One, it says, well, I'm sitting here in this chair where I'm comfortable, and I'm reading about something that makes me have to sort of start from scratch mm -hmm. and try and understand, because I want to. I want to do that work. Right. Oh, this is something that's connected to a voice, a theoretical person. Right. Somehow I'm moving away from my own sense of being and into another person's. That, I, I do believe that's good practice. Right. Modeling the way we should be as citizens more. Yeah. Right. Um, Would you read a poem called Refuge? Sure. Should we read a new book on page 73? Can they buy these books out there in the lobby? Yes. OK, good. <laughs> Product placement. <laughs> <laughs> refuge. Until I can understand why you fled, why you are willing to bleed, why you deserve what I must be willing to seed, let me imagine you are my mother in Montgomery, Alabama, walking to campus rather than riding the bus. I know what they call you. I know what they try to convince you you lack. I know your tired ankles, the sudden thunder of your laugh. Until I want to give you what I myself deserve, let me love you by loving her, your sister in a camp in Turkey, 16, deserving of everything. Let her be my daughter, who has curled her neat hands into fists, insisting nothing is fair, and I have never loved her. Naomi, lips set in a scowl, young heart ransacking its cell. Let me lend her passion to your sister and love her for her living rage, her need for more, and now and all. Let me leap from sleep if her voice sounds out afraid from down the hall. I've seen men like your father walking up Harrison Street now that the days are getting longer. Let me love them as I love my own father, whom I phoned once from a valley in my life to say what I feared I'd never adequately said. Voice choked, stalled, hearing the silence spread around us like weather. What would it cost me to say it now to a stranger's father, walking home to our separate lives together. It's just a, it's just a gorgeous poem, uh, which reenacts the golden rule at the center of all the world's faith, at the center of every ethical system, is that we should feel what someone else is feeling. Until I understand you, the poem begins, which is a pretty hopeful line, that we will. Yeah. If we make the effort. Or we'll be like those kids at the table, at like 12, after everyone's to bed, still with like a couple Brussels sprouts. <laughs> but either way, <laughs> there is time. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's just such a poem for, for this moment. Uh, we've got a recording of a poem called Second Estrangement. Can you set that up for sure. us? Sure. Um, this is a poem by Araceli's Germay. Um, a poet um, who, it comes from her most recent collection, which is called Black Mariah, and it's thinking about the African diaspora in different parts of the world. Um, I think those are the, the large thematic questions, but more urgent or, or salient is the sense of um, displacement that maybe any person can have feel access to. So this is a poem that kind of builds that in these really familiar and very visceral terms. Second estrangement. Please raise your hand, whomever else of you has been a child lost in a market or a mall without knowing it at first, 
following a stranger accidentally thinking he is yours, your family or parent, even grabbing for his hands, even calling the word you said then for father, only to see the face look strangely down, utterly foreign, utterly not the one who loves you, you who are a bird suddenly stunned by the glass partitions of rooms. How far the world you knew and tall and filled finally with strangers. What I love about that poem is that it reenacts uh, that sense of alienation and fear in a way that makes us feel like everyone else. Mm -hmm. It overcomes the very problem it enacts, which is just incredibly clever. I love the way it kind of guides you into that too because you don't know that's where you're going. I mean, the title might alert you to something, but it's also second estrangement. Um, but it begins, please raise your hand. And I think that's the first line. And I, you know, I'm a good student, I wanna do it. <laughs> and then, you know, whoever else among you and then we descend step by step into this feeling of, you know, first you're just alone in a mall, or then you're lost, and then you're without this person, and then we realize, you know, there's a private language, the word you used then for father. Um, again, it, it almost could behave like that John Yao poem. Maybe there's a real language barrier, or maybe it's just, I'm not at home anymore. Um, and then that uh, image of the bird Birds in the wrong places come up in poems, I guess. Right. Um, but it creates that feeling of abrupt shock. Yes. Um, and so all of the you know, willingness that we have demonstrated to follow this poem leads us to that same place um, of being lost and scared and stuck. Um, and the poem can sort of speak to that. And reminds us that we've all felt that, that mm -hmm. there is a connection. As much anxiety as there's been recently about the political contention of our age, it's not the worst it's ever been. Uh, we've got the Civil War back there, and several of your poems uh, are inspired by the Civil War, draw actual text from the Civil War uh, in fascinating ways. Uh, can you tell us about that and read a poem called Declaration? Sure. Um, well, the Civil War kind of um, got drawn into this body of work by the Smithsonian. Um, I was invited by the National Portrait Gallery, Gallery um, in the year that was leading up to the 150th anniversary of the beginning of the Civil War to contribute a poem um, for an exhibition. There was gonna be portraits and, and, and poems. Um, and I had to sort of say, I want to do this because I want to write a poem but I don't know how to make myself want to write about the Civil War, right. which I've never liked learning about. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking with another black writer recently about how every time we would get to that moment in history growing up uh, where it was slavery and the Civil War, we, we as the black kids in the classroom were made to feel shame. Like, how could this have happened to us? Right. Um, and so I was conditioned to feel like, oh, here we go again. But I wanted to do it. So I said, um, what would black soldiers have experienced in this conflict? Mm -hmm. And I found a couple of really great books that just contain all these primary documents um, that prevented me from doing what I wanted to do, which would be to write something in my own voice, um, and urged me simply to listen and bring these voices into conversation with, with each other. Um, what were these documents? Uh, letters that soldiers and their families had written to each other and to Abraham Lincoln, oh. and um, depositions that veterans and their d widows and descendants had given after the war well into the 20, 20th century um, in an attempt to get the pensions that they as veterans should have been entitled to but that they were denied because having been born into slavery, they didn't have birth certificates, yeah. marriage licenses, they didn't have anything attesting to the fact that they had changed their names mm -hmm. after emancipation, and so they, they got stiffed, basically. Oh. Oh. So that's where that came from, and then suddenly this history felt so alive and active and relevant. Right, because you were hearing voices that are usually suppressed in history books. Yeah, or that get, yeah, they're suppressed or they're just absent, yeah. you know, or they're, they're, they get reduced to, well, th this happened to these people. Right. Um, and, uh, and so then I said, I want to go deeper into this. So then the document of the Declaration of Independence seemed like another um, source 
to say, well, what would it say to now if I could have my way with it? Um, so this is the poem that came from that, and it's, it's an erasure. So there are um, what I think of as the specific terms that clarify that this is a you know, complaint against the king of England, and suddenly it felt like it was large enough to um, other voices of the circumstances of our I was reading it um, uh, just what what can I I was actually heard the other thing saying the, the sections, do you think, or just the one? Oh, you want me to read the first letter? Okay. Um, positive. One letter. Um, and even the spelling, uh, I left because it seemed uh, urgent. Mm -hmm. I will tell you the truth about this. I will tell you all about it. Carlisle, Pennsylvania, November 21st, 1864. Mr. Abraham Lincoln, I want to know, sir, if you please, whether I can have my son released from the army. He is all the support I have now. His father is dead, and his brother, that was all the help I had. He has been wounded twice. He has not had anything to send me yet. Now I am old, and my head is blossoming for the grave. And if you do, I hope the Lord will bless you and me. They say called out, you know, yes. um, because they they do what so little does, which is to restore the sense of humanity and actually like blood and life and voices and stories to history. You know, I mean, I shouldn't say so little else does, but so often yes. um, it's not the first version of history that you get no. as a student. Right now, you were in South Carolina and Kentucky, uh, places where debates about how to memorialize the Civil War are still running pretty hot. Did that subject come up? Well, this poem came up. Yes. Um, <laughs> and um, it was something that I think people heard in a way that's really similar to how I heard those voices. Um, it was something that, you know, people would come up to me afterwards. So when I'm reading my own poems, I don't always say, okay, what do you notice? Because that seems um, <laughs> wrong. Um, so. If somebody notices something, some, maybe they'll say it afterward. And this is the poem that people want to talk about because you know it, it does that for them too in some way. Um, when we were in South Carolina, we were um, in a place where I think the 55th Massachusetts volunteers had fought, um, and that was commemorated. And so there was um, you know a sense of this is our history. This is here in a way too. Right. So. Yeah. You're going to read a poem called The Political Poem. OK. What, <laughs> what is the function of a political poem in an age like ours? It seems different than it was during the Vietnam War, during the Civil Rights era. What is a political poem nowadays? And how does this poem you're about to read answer that question? Um, well, I think a political poem in any age is um, valuable if it can challenge the easy sense of us versus them. So political poems that fail don't do that. They, they say, I'm on the us, which is good, yes. and I'm going to call out these thems. Um, Just propaganda, mm -hmm. rallying crowd. Yeah, even if you're thinking in terms of justice, you're making bad art if that's the way that you're going to do it. Mm. So I think a good political poem says, OK, perhaps this is what I as a person believe, but I've got a question, and I'm going to have to explore it in ways that open we're going to put that on the line and call it into question and move me toward an uncomfortable sense of perhaps um, complicity or implication in part of the problem as I see it. I want to do an organic kind of like walkthrough and, and think about what I'm made to acknowledge. Um, I feel like there are lots of poems that do that. Yes. Um, I liked adding the title political poem to this poem because that makes you feel like, oh, 
God, what is going to come at me? Yeah. Um, and this is a poem that um, wasn't even written with politics in mind. Really? Yeah. Because it definitely plays with that theme and plays with its title mm -hmm. in a very witty, conscious way. Yeah, no, this was a poem that, that I wrote um, thinking about, like, I was in Vermont. I was, um, I actually was having a dream that I was in a room where there was a poem on a, like, as a mural on a wall that I was reading aloud to somebody. And then I said, this is not a poem by somebody else. If I wake up, this can be my poem. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I got up and sat, and I was in Vermont, so I think Robert Frost's, you know, mowers were probably in the air, and um, I recaptured, to the extent that I could, that poem. And I, I published it, and it was called The Mowers. Oh. And then um, later, I read it, and I said, I think this is going to make more sense if I change the title. Yes. So. Or it makes a difference then. Yeah, better sense. sense. Yes. Um, 50, 54. Okay. Political poem. If those mowers were each to stop at the whim, say, of a greedy thought, and then the one off to the left were to let his arm float up, stirring the air with that wide, slow, underwater gesture, meaning, hello, and you there, aimed at the one more than a mile away to the right. And if he, in his work, were to pause, catching that call by sheer wish, and send back his own slow, one-armed dance, meaning yes, and here, as if threaded to a single long nerve, before remembering his tool and shearing another message into the earth, letting who can say how long graze past until another thought or just the need to know might make him stop and look up again at the other, raising his arm as if to say something like, still and oh, and then to catch the flicker of joy, rise up along those other legs and flare into another bright yes that sways a moment in the darkening air. Their work would carry them into the better part of evening, each mowing ahead and doubling back, then looking up to catch sight of his echo, sought and held in that instant of common understanding. The God and speed of it coming out only after both have turned back to face the sea of yet and slow. If they could, and if what glimmered like a fish were to dart back and forth across that wide, wordless distance, the day, though gone, would never know the ache of being done. If they thought to, or would, or even half wanted, their work, the humming human engines pushed across the grass, and the grass, blade after blade assenting, would take forever but I love how long it would last. How can such a poem help us rethink the political standoff we find ourselves in? <laughs> well, it's kind of begging, begging one to change the scale upon which we're thinking and say, okay, it's, it's easy to get mad at like a big group of, a demographic. Yes. Um, but if you reduce it to one person out there doing his version of what you're over here doing, maybe it would feel different. Yes, that's lovely. It's really, really lovely. There's a whole bunch of people nearby you need to talk to. <laughs> uh, in the introduction to uh, Wade in the Water, you write, this is why I love poems. They invite me to sit down and listen to a voice speaking thoughtfully and passionately about what it feels like to be alive. Usually, the someone doing the talking, the poem speaker, is a person I'd never met, got the chance to meet were it not for this poem. More and more, the way we get our news, uh, the way we interact online through Facebook and, and other social media, uh, we only interact with people who think just like we do. We don't see people that don't think like us. We silence them, we avoid them, we listen to the right news, etc. Uh, can we listen to a poem called 
My Brother at 3 a.m. And can you tell us about oh, that? Oh, yeah. Uh, this is by Natalie Diaz. Um, it's from a collection called When My Brother Was an Aztec. And so there's this family in the center of the book. Um, it's, it's on such a mythic scale that I don't know if it's a, a real life family or if it's a, an imagined family that allows a certain dramatic um, situation to play out. But there's a brother in that family who is an addict and is, you know, causing all of this upheaval, um, changing the way that the speaker of the poems thinks about herself about you know, what she belongs to, what, what the threats are. But it's also a book that is um, kind of like testifying to um, what it feels like to grow up as a Native American kid in the United States and to feel, um, I guess, unseen, unvalued, or seen through a caricature lens. Hmm. Um, so there are these, and, and then it's a book that's also got some really beautiful love poems and poems that kind of play with literary history in, in beautiful, moving ways. Um, but this is a poem that um, is kind of haunting. Yes, yes. Can we hear that now? My brother at 3 a.m. He sat cross-legged, weeping on the steps when mom unlocked and opened the front door. Oh God, he said, oh God. He wants to kill me, Mom. When Mom unlocked and opened the front door at 3 a.m., she was in her nightgown. Dad was asleep. He wants to kill me, he told her, looking over his shoulder. 3 a.m. and in her nightgown, Dad asleep. What's going on, she asked. Who wants to kill you? He looked over his shoulder. The devil does. Look at him over there. She asked, what are you on? Who wants to kill you? The sky wasn't black or blue, but the green of a dying night. The devil, look at him, over there. He pointed to the corner house. The sky wasn't black or blue, but the dying green of night. Stars had closed their eyes or sheathed their knives. My brother pointed to the corner house. His lips flickered with sores. Stars had closed their eyes or sheathed their knives. Oh God, I can see the tail, he said. Oh God, look. Mom winced at the sores on his lips. It's sticking out from behind the house. Oh God, see the tail, he said. Look at the goddamned tail. He sat cross-legged, weeping on the front steps. Mom finally saw it, a hellish vision, my brother. Oh God, oh God, she said. It doesn't seem like a political poem at all, except that it forces us to do what you hope poetry will make us do, mm -hmm. which is to cross over barriers, to sympathize, to feel in ways we didn't, to, with people we didn't think we knew. Yeah. It's, it's a poem that kind of urges you to say, to stop saying, well, that's not my problem. Right. And to say, oh, I wonder what that woman the mother. feels like. Yeah. Or this kid who's kind of watching all of this. This is one of the poems that, um, this was the last poem, I think, that we read in the Men's Rehab Center. Um, I didn't want to lead with it, because obvious reasons, but I didn't want to not read it, because I wanted to know what they might make of it. Right. And, um, they saw a lot, you know, of this struggle, this, you know, this awful monster that's kind of riding the brother. That made sense to them. Um, his inability to, to really be able to translate his experience to the family members, which I think the poem manages, interestingly, by, by making that, that creature um, real to the brother and invisible to everybody else. Um, but they also, I, I think I'm not wrong in connecting this to that afternoon. Um, someone there said, it's interesting, where's the dad? This is the mom, she's bearing all the weight. And so suddenly, it was an even, even an opportunity for someone who maybe had been in a version of this story to empathize with another figure, you know? Right. Uh, which seemed really insightful to me. Right, that opportunity that a great poem gives us to empathize with people that we don't run into uh, is a great gift. Yeah, I think it's a great gift, and I just don't think it's one to be taken lightly. I don't think that it's enough to say, oh yeah, empathy, kumbaya, 
Um, I, think that's, I think that's one of the things that creates a sense of toxicity that we are all kind of you know, reeling from. We're producing it by writing off these simple but mean, potentially meaningful acts. Um, and so I think, you know, okay, read a poem and, and try and believe in what it causes you to, to, to feel. Right. Um, I think that's actual work. I do too. You told the New York Times, that's another newspaper on the East Coast, uh, <laughs> there's a deep and interesting kind of troubling that poems do. I love that. Tell us what that troubling is. Hmm. Well, you know, I like that word, right? The, it's kind of like the anchor for that title poem, but it, you know, which comes from the song and the, the biblical story of an angel troubling the water so that it would protect the Israelites as they're passing to safety, but so that it would also heal them of any kind of affliction. And so troubling is a stirring up, but of course stirring up is also trouble. Yes. Um, and I think art is something that asks us to do both. Would you read a poem called The United States Welcomes You? Yeah. 41. Okay. Um, I want to tell you that this poem um, is another one of those poems that got a different title after, after it was written. Um, I was thinking about, um, it's placed pretty close on the wake of the Civil War poem. And I was thinking about what it feels like to be taken as a stranger in the country you belong to. Mm -hmm. um, and then this title was the title that um, figured out that I wanted to give it to, give to the poem. The United States welcomes you. Why and by whose power were you sent? What do you see that you may wish to steal? Why this dancing? Why do your dark bodies drink up all the light? What are you demanding that we feel? Have you stolen something? Then what is that leaping in your chest? What is the nature of your mission? Do you seek to offer a confession? Have you anything to do with others brought by us to harm? Then why are you afraid? And why do you invade our night Hands raised, eyes wide, mute as ghosts. Is there something you wish to confess? Is this some enigmatic type of test? What if we fail? How and to whom do we address our appeal? For an immigrant nation, this is a really troubling poem. Um, you once said you wish that more poets were brave or generous enough to risk failing at something that matters. What matters most to you as a poet? I, I asked a student that once when she was in my office and um, we were talking about her poems and I was giving her feedback and she bristled at every suggestion I made and I said, what's going on here? What's at stake for you? Um, What's in this room with us right now that's causing this? And she said, I just want to write truth. And she burst into tears. And I love her, you know? <laughs> and I feel that way too. I want something that's not just a testament to me and feeling, you know, proud of this momentary thing I might be or something I feel like I might know. I want to write poems that are going to push me to kind of touch that big thing, you know? And you mostly won't, right? That's the failure that I'm kind of setting myself up for. But the wish is like, I want something that's gonna make this life kind of bearable, you know, or, or something. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the less kind of like lofty answer is I'm interested in what we do to each other in all the contexts that we operate in, you know, in families, in relationships, in society, um, and what, why, what's the fallout from that, and, and, and what could we take from that? It's such an honor to talk to you tonight and to hear you talk about poetry. Thank you so My much. My honor, thank you.
Thank you, Tracy and Ron, for a remarkable event. I'm Rob Casper, the head of the Poetry and Literature Center here at the library, and I have just a few announcements before I'll let you go. First of all, a week from today, the center will kick off its first ever podcast series featuring our 21st Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry. I know it's technology, but it's still <laughs> worth listening to. Um, this is the website, www.lsc.gov slash poetry. <laughs> Give in to your inner techie self and go there, please. Uh, second, if you haven't already, please fill out the survey forms you received when coming in. You can drop them off uh, at the table up in the foyer. Your input helps us improve events such as these. Uh, and we'll have a book signing in the Whitall Pavilion, which is right next door. Uh, the book sales are outside that room, and we hope you'll get a signed copy and congratulate Tracy in person. Uh, finally, this event concludes the library's literary season. But I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that just down the street, there's a big, big, big poetry festival taking place. Split This Rock is celebrating its 10th anniversary, and its blockbuster evening readings, like this one, are free and open to the public. You can go to their website, uh, but you can just look around, keep your ears open, and you'll hear some poetry, and it will be great. Enjoy the rest of National Poetry Month, and hope to see you back here soon. Thank you.